Good evening, everyone. I hope everybody's doing well. I uh, apologize for running a few minutes behind. I know everybody probably knows there was an accident just outside here, so I know a few people just got caught up in the traffic, so we'll try to stay on schedule. Uh, but I want to thank everybody for returning for our second part of the workshop. Um, and I'm sure this will be just as valuable as this first part. Um, and uh, I know that it seems like the seasons have changed since the last time we were here. It seemed like it was summer then and it's winter now. So we have watched the seasons change. Uh, so Raf Martinez from Access National Bank is here to moderate the panel uh, this evening for us again. So I want to definitely thank you, uh, thank Access National Bank for sponsoring this workshop, which is definitely fantastic and we really appreciate your time and help with this workshop. Uh, we have a couple of new members on the panel, which Raf will introduce. Uh, I also would like to introduce Kate Fulkerson, our CEO, who is joining us tonight. Um, and so to that hold things up, I'll just send it right over to Raf. Sure. We'll uh, take it from the top. Thank you, Raf. Absolutely. Thank you, Anna. Good, e good evening, everybody. I want to thank you all for being here again for part two of our Ask the Experts best practices for your cluster management seminar. Uh, we're thrilled to be here and we're excited to, uh, to wrap up this seminar series. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping issues. Uh, at about 10 minutes till eight, we will end the panel discussion. We do want to get some feedback from the attendees here. Our intention is to continue to do these type of seminars, but we would like your feedback on what you heard here over the last uh, two events and see what other topics you would like for us to bring to the forefront and shine a spotlight on. So we will stop at around 7.50 to conduct that. Uh, but we also have some material in the back row, some business cards for all the panelists here, and including some educational material. Uh, we do have two, uh, two new panelists today, so we're, we'll introduce them uh, accordingly. So again, we are doing part two of the Ask the Ex Experts Best Practices for Your Cluster Management. I am Rafael Martinez. I'm the Community Association Segment Manager for Access National Bank, a community bank headquartered here in Reston, Virginia. Uh, just some uh, banking update news. We did announce this week a strategic acquisition of Middleburg Bank. So we are continuing to grow. So our Reston base is growing, going a little deeper into Loudoun County and south. But we're very excited about this growth opportunity. But our core focus is still working with community associations and like-minded organizations. So we're very happy to be here. Uh, we are very honored and happy and thrilled to have a, uh, these very uh, talented speakers and panelists. So without further ado, we will go down the line, have everybody introduce themselves. They'll give us their name, name of the company, and how long they've been working with community associations. Lori? I'm Lori Ryder. I'm from Savory Insurance. I've been working with community associations for about 14 years now between the property management and the insurance industry. Thank you, Lori. Uh, good evening. Uh, again, I'm Stu Willis. I'm a senior vice president with the Falcon Group, where we are engineers, architects, and capital reserve specialists. Uh, I've been with Falcon for some 11 years now, and I've been performing capital reserve studies since 1989. Thank you, Howard. Uh, <clears throat> my name's Howard Goklang. Uh, my uh, company is uh, Goklang. Uh, a group and associates. We are a CPA firm that does audits exclusively of uh, community associations, condominiums, and housing cooperatives. And uh, we actually are uh, physically located in this. Thank you, Howard. Bruce? Good evening, everybody, again. Bruce Eastmunt with the law firm of Chadwick Washington. Like Howard's <coughs> firm, our firm focuses solely on the representation of homeowners associations, condominiums. Uh, we also have the distinct honor of representing the Reston Association. I am uh, a former president of a condominium association in Falls Church and vice president of a master association, uh, both in Falls Church, Virginia. Also the incoming president of uh, Washington Metro Chapter of CAI, and I've been in the industry for about nine years. Great. Thank you, Bruce. 
And my name again is Rafael Martinez. I'm the Community Association Segment Manager for Access National Bank, focusing all of our efforts in the Community Association market. I focus on lending and treasury management for community associations. I am a certified treasury professional, which is a distinction that shows expertise in risk management and capital preservation. Along with Bruce, I also serve on the board of directors at the CAI local chapter. And Bruce uh, was very, being very modest, but he was elected last year to be the incoming president. So we're very happy to have him here, and we wish him the best of luck at his term that's upcoming. So congrats, Bruce. Absolutely. So just to review the, uh, the rules of the road here, this is a panel discussion that's meant to be interactive. So we have some questions that we'll throw out to the panelists for them to dive into a little bit, talk to sharing some of their expertise and their subject matter. Uh, but if you have a question or a concern or something that comes up, please feel free to raise your hand. On your desk, you have one of these small little microphones. Please use that to a uh, ask your question so everybody in the room can hear. Uh, so please uh, feel free to raise your hand anytime, and we're happy to field your question. Uh, before we get started, I do want I do have a uh, another plug for the Community Association Institute. We talked about resources last time, and somebody asked about some more information. I gave out the website. In your packet, you should have two pages that talk about the mission statement and the history of CAI. So take a look at it when you get a chance. It's just uh, another resource for you to log into as you uh, face the challenges of the Community Association Volunteer Leader. Okay. So last time we had a lot of discussion on insurance, so much so that we said, hey, we could, we could do an entire seminar strictly on insurance. So we put Lori in the corner specifically for her to start it off <laughs> and come on over here. Uh, so again, we're going to ask some questions about insurance, Lori, and if you can just kind of tell us, the last time we were here, some of the concerns were understanding the different types of policies that were available for, for community associations, why they would apply to some and not some others, and determining how, how can a community association board determine the right amount of insurance that's needed. So one of the first ones that was talked about was DNO. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, can everybody hear me? First of all, microphone. Yeah, this helps. Yeah, I tend to talk very softly. Um, directors and officers liability insurance is designed to protect the community association and the board members from lawsuits that result from the actions or decisions you make while you're serving on the board. Um, there are a lot of different types of programs out there and the best of them offer protection for you as a member of the board and for your association from damages and defense costs resulting from alleged wrongful acts and lawsuits. But to, to put it in everyday terms, I think one of the most recent claims I saw was uh, an allegation from a unit owner that the board had made decisions in executive session improperly. Uh, I'm sure you've probably seen plenty of those complaints. So it, it's things like that that will come up under the director's and officer's insurance. Uh, and the DNO is important to protect the association's assets because most of the time in the bylaws you're going to indemnify the individual board members as long as they're acting in their capacity as a member of the board of directors. Correct. Yes. And Lori, is there is there different flavors of DNO insurance or is it just a general term for it? There, can you get more specific or is it really just There are specific programs launched by different insurance carriers. Um, the standalone policies, we call them monoline policies, are pretty much the same. They'll cover discrimination, they'll cover employment practices, liability. Um, so if you have employees, uh, the standalone policies will cover employment practices, liability for things like um, sexual harassment, things like that. Um, there are also endorsements that can be added to your standard package policy. Mm -hmm. However, those endorsements are nowhere near as broad. Uh, right. They don't provide the same amount of coverage. Uh, they're far cheaper, obviously, so that's why a lot of associations will decide to use the endorsement instead of the standalone policy. Sure. So some of the questions that I get as well is for insurance companies, there's a lot of insurance companies. How, how can boards or, and associations know that they're talking to somebody who understands the policies that make sense for community associations? 
Well, I, I think that's kind of tied in with the last question, how do you choose your agent? Sure. Um, you want an agent that definitely understands what your needs are, and part of that is do they have experience in the community association industry? I mean, how long have they been working with community associations? Do they understand how community associations are governed and legally put together? Uh, you want somebody who understands that. And later when we're talking about choosing an insurance agent, mm -hmm. uh, I'll get more into detail sure. there. Um, as far as the carriers go, um, there are several major companies, Travelers, CNA, uh, Chubb, to name a few, mm -hmm. uh, that have tailored their DNO coverage specifically for community associations. So you want to make sure you have a program that's tailored for communities instead of somebody that's going out and getting you a DNO quote that's kind of generic and could be for anybody like a bank. Right, right. Something like that. Uh, the community policies are tailored so that you have coverage for the contracted property manager, mm -hmm. uh, the volunteers. Um, it, those are really important things when you're running your association on managers and volunteers for the most part. Sure, sure. Yes, sir. Uh, what's a typical level of liability insurance that uh, a cluster association could carry? For, we, we have a million dollars. For DNO? Um, are we talking DNO strictly, or uh, are we getting into well, What is DNO again? Directors and officers. Directors and officers insurance. Okay. I, all I know is we have a liability uh, policy of a million dollars. And, and as far as covering the directors and officers, uh, we have a fidelity bond. And that is it. Okay. So it sounds like what you're saying is you have a general liability policy with a $1 million limit. Um, that would be my minimum recommendation, would be a $1 million per occurrence, $2 million aggregate. Uh, you can buy an umbrella policy that would provide additional coverage if that policy were, to, those limits were to be exhausted. Um, it sounds like you might have, I'm sure you probably have DNO coverage, but it sounds like it might be an endorsement to that general liability policy, which is where it will normally yes. show up. So um, I would, without actually seeing the policy forms, I can't get too specific, but it sounds like you need to look about look into getting mm -hmm. a quote for the... Um, sure, I think Bruce has a comment on this. If, if I could just add, as a former volunteer myself, I think the DNO policy is an extremely important policy. It protects you. While you are doing a wonderful thing by volunteering for your respective associations, and you're putting yourself out there, you're putting yourself at risk. Uh, and if you don't have that policy, I, I think that you're doing yourself a disservice. So I would recommend that you speak to an insurance provider, someone who deals regularly with community associations, uh, so that they can tailor the policy, as Lori said. Uh, it's extremely important, I believe. Right. We have another question here, sir. Green means go. If it's green. <laughs> yeah, uh, I have a couple of questions, I guess. One is. Um, and I apologize if I'm asking something that was answered last time. It wasn't no, please go ahead. Here. Um, but with respect to um, liability, when would the individuals on the board become, uh, you, you mentioned in, indemnity. And I, I, I wonder if there's any kind of typical limits to what that would be and where the individual members of the board might be um, liable in some way and, and if these uh, and what ex exclusions would typically be in one of these policies um, around that where where where, do, where where does the boundary get crossed between the corporate um, liability and individual board members liability that might be a combo answer between bruce and <laughs> <laughs> all that you handle the ex i have another a, a follow-up there's a follow-up sure which, which is with respect to you know if if there are individual liabilities, would a typical personal umbrella um, liability pro policy cover that kind of a contingency? 
Okay. Bruce? I'll go ahead and start by addressing your, your personal liability question. Uh, in most documents, and it's very document specific, there, there is an, an affirmative obligation for the association to step in and indemnify its directors. Indemnification, for those who, who may not be aware of what the term means, is essentially a third party stepping in to pay for your legal defense and any judgment obtained against you. For most documents and most associations, that is going to kick in automatically, provided that you have not conducted yourself with bad faith as a director or willful misconduct. Uh, as I said, each set of documents has maybe a different standard, but as long as you're meeting your fiduciary duties to the, to the association, uh, you should be uh, indemnified under those provisions. If you don't have those provisions in your governing documents, there is a provision in the Non-Stock Act uh, that says, I believe, that the association may step in and indemnify you. Uh, an issue you may want to talk to counsel about. Correct. I'll let Lori address the issue of exclusions and then uh, personal policies. The, uh, with regard to the exclusions, to be honest, it really depends on which program you're talking about. And that's why you really need an agent that's working on your behalf to compare the different programs. Um, the, like I said, the endorsements that get put on the package policies, they're going to exclude things like discrimination, um, non-monetary claims. Um, they're going to exclude employment practices liability. Uh, the coverage that's included on an endorsement that gets slapped onto another policy is very, very limited. Uh, when you get to comparing the larger programs that are meant to be more robust, uh, they'll exclude things like uh, it, there's occasionally a claim for third party property damage. Somebody claims that something that the board has done or decided has damaged their property. Uh, that type of thing would not be covered under the DNO policy because that's really intended to be under the general liability. So you really need somebody to help you figure out how to mesh the different policies together to the point where uh, it reduces your out of pocket exposure. Now, I think the follow up question was a personal policy, correct? Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, if, uh, just wondering if anything that would fall outside of, of, uh, of the corporate policy for the board would possibly fall under a personal umbrella. Uh, that's a possibility. I actually don't work with personal insurance, but I left my card back there. And if you like, if you'd like to take one, I can certainly have somebody get in touch with you from our personal lines department. Yes, ma'am. I might, I might have a partial answer to that. Sure. Um, after our session two weeks ago, when uh, it came, I think Bruce, it was you who said. Uh, you should probably see if your personal umbrella policy provides additional protection. I called my insurance sure. company, which is Geico, and they see, they said they were a little like, huh. Mm, I don't know if we've had <laughs> before. You, you don't actually write the checks yourself because we're a managed, sure. professionally managed community. And then they basically said, well, we will add it to the notes to your policy that you are a member of your condo association board, hmm. and then you should be fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I left that with a not so good Sure, answer. sure. <laughs> not the full warm and fuzzy, right. <laughs> Well, again, it goes back to your subject matter experts. If you know, if uh, if you're not satisfied with the answer, ask somebody else or ask somebody for a referral that somebody may be able to give you a answer. Yes, sir. Yeah, just just to follow up on his, his comment. So, so in my experience, as a practical matter, a lot of people who serve on boards, you know, don't have necessarily relevant experience. And so, if they're having board meetings without notifying their residents that obviously violates state law. Or you have board members who are regular citizens and they're reluctant to enforce the rules and regulations. Those two examples, I mean, those two actions, do they gut your insurance? If, if you fail to, as a board member, comply with state law or you fail to enforce your own covenants, does that undermine your insurance coverage and, and your uh, officers and directors policy. 
Over the years, I've seen several claims that have progressed. Um, the, the ones that I can think of eventually ended up being closed with no payment to the suing party, but um, the, the carrier did pay defense costs. And that's really what they're there for, is to pay the defense costs so that you as a board member don't have to pay that out of pocket. Sure, and I think your question also dovetails into what Bruce does as well. So I'll move on to, to, uh, to Bruce. And, and the question I had for you, Bruce, to kick this off was, obviously you're counsel, you're there in case your, your people need you, but prior to getting to that level, what, what are best practices for community association clusters to kind of have uh, conflict resolution? And I think that kind of goes into what you were saying. Sure, I'm sure none of you have ever dealt with any conflicts in your age. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's an issue. We have people living in close quarters, and there are going to be people who breach our covenants, who break our rules. Uh, conflict, unfortunately, I think is, is inevitable when you're living in a close-knit, common interest community. But I think sometimes people on, on directors, we read these stories of, of the directors who are acting unreasonable. But they file a lawsuit immediately without really going through any steps to try to resolve an issue before getting to that. I think there are steps you can take before we get to, let's call Bruce and file suit and, and bring fire and brimstone down on him. Um, really, I think communication is key. Sending a warning letter, sending a friendly letter, even uh, letting somebody know that, hey, I'm not sure if you're aware, we do have covenants, this is a violation. They're your neighbors, perhaps that could be a, a good first step. A lot of times when we hear things that rise to the level of litigation, sometimes the other side's biggest complaint is they never reached out to me and talked to me. And I think a lot of conflicts could be resolved at that level by just going out and communicating. Make sure that you're communicating effectively through your notices. Uh, be careful with the tone of your notes, but sometimes there are needs and requirements to make those communications formal. They should be consistent so that you don't have uh, the allegation that you're unfairly or so selectively enforcing your covenants against others in different ways than you are against uh, certain people. But I think it's important to, to communicate effectively. I also think it's important to be transparent. When you have board meetings, make sure they're open. Make sure residents can come and talk to you and air their grievances. I found that the more open and transparent associations are, uh, the less sort of hostility and likelihood for conflict there, there are. But having said that, there are occasions when you can try to communicate, you can try to talk friendly with people, and some people simply will not uh, adhere to the covenants. And when you've exhausted all of your other remedies, sometimes the only thing you can do is seek counsel and follow the legal remedies that are set forth in your governing documents. But again, you may want to talk to counsel when you have a conflict, but sometimes resorting to litigation should be your, your, your last resort. Correct, correct. Yes, sir. Is the state on buds one having much impact? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the question. I can repeat that. Okay. The question was, is the state ombudsman having much impact? Um, I don't know that I can answer if she's having much impact, but I certainly know that she is in receipt of quite a few uh, uh, complaints. She, she has a, a listing on her website of her opinions that she's given uh, in the past. Uh, Heather Gillespie, I, I've worked with her. She's a very fair um, ombudsman. She does a tremendous job down in Richmond, and I'm very thankful for the service that she provides to our associations. Um, but keep in mind that those complaints for the ombudsman need to be based on uh, allegations that an association has breached Virginia law or Virginia regulation. A lot of the complaints that she does receive are about the association, allegations that an association or a board has breached their own governing documents. And those are issues that she's not going to step into. So for me, what I find is, is most individual owners, when they make a complaint, they're complaining about procedure, governing document procedure. Um, so to answer the question in that regard, perhaps there's a, a, a section of those that Heather can help with uh, if associations are violating uh, state law or state regulation, but there, there is a missing piece there that associations need to handle internally. Correct. Great answer, Bruce. Bruce, in, in, in terms of communication, one thing that I've been asked often, and I'd love to get your opinion on, is uh, how do boards communicate 
internally and to uh, the population at large. What is your what are your thoughts on best practice for email use? Should you use as a board member use your personal email address? Should you not? <laughs> Should you use a, a generic one, Bruce? What what are your thoughts? That's that's a great question, and I have a little bit of a soapbox that I get on when I talk to clients about this. How many of you use your work email account for board business? Raise your hand if you're doing it. I'm so glad to see it. No one in my view should be doing that. Um, you're, keep in mind, when you're serving as a director and you're emailing back and forth about uh, board business, it's potentially discoverable. And if you're using your work server, your work email address, uh, to communicate back and forth with board business, in the event of some litigation, and in the event that the other side gets a court order to do so, that work server could be seized and looked through by opposing counsel. I don't think your employers would be too happy about that if that were the case. So. I typically recommend to clients that you get a separate email address for board business, certainly separate from work. Uh, you may want to even go that extra step and have completely separate from your own personal matters as well. Because if, if again, if, if somebody has a court order to, to look through your personal email through uh, discovery, they're going to not only see your board business, but your other personal business. So keep in mind that's always out there. One other issue, quick sure, sure. email. Um, be careful with email. In Virginia, meetings of the boards are meant to be open and notice to the community. If the board is having significant back and forth deliberation over email, you're not really being open, transparent. Your members can't come and view and watch you deliberate and make those decisions. So excessive use of email is arguably against Virginia law. Uh, that's not to say you can't use email for information distribution. Hey, directors, here's the contract that we're going to review and look at at the next meeting. Please be prepared. Uh, hey, directors, uh, we have this emergency issue we've got to address. Uh, you know, the garage is on fire. We have to figure something out. I don't know. Whatever the emergency would be. Uh, emergency is a good idea. And also for scheduling purposes. I think if you limit your use of email to those three uh, items, you can, you'll be playing it safe. No, that's fantastic. Yes, sir. What about any problems with um, using email to make notices about when board meetings are going to be or anything like that? Do you still, is it still a good idea to use the old-fashioned put a sign up or... So, the good, good question. The question comes to notice. Is email to your members good notice if you have to send your meeting, uh, your notice of your board meetings out to your members? Uh, two things. Virginia statute basically says that notice of your board meetings needs to be... Uh, posted or put somewhere where it's reasonably available to a majority of your members. If a majority of your members have email access, they've told you, here's my email address, please notify me of meetings, I think that's sufficient. But getting back to the CICB ombudsman, mm. Heather has given the opinion that the absolute best method for getting the word out for your, your board meetings is the sandwich board at the front of your cluster of your association that says, HOA meeting, Tuesday night, 7 p.m., be there. Uh, that's that's probably the best practice as of now, but anything you can do above that to put the word out, I think is a wonderful idea. Fantastic. Great question, great response. And in my experience dealing with board members, some of them will create treasure at xyzassociation at gmail.com or president. That way they have a historical record of the ongoing, et cetera, et cetera. So just my two cents on the conversation, but I, I do see that more. Yes, ma'am. We'll sort of tie this to that sure. in a second. You've got a generic one. A lot of times you may have a generic one forwarded onto your personal mm -hmm. aspect. Sure. So does that sort of bridge it over? So would it only be limited to treasure at cluster? Or would it actually... I'll, I'll defer to counsel on that. <laughs> but I, I would... Bruce? I'm not sure I quite understand exactly what you're going for there. But what I would say is that it, to the extent that you can separate the board business from your personal or work email account uh, would be the best practice approach. Great. Okay. Was there a question? Yes, ma'am. Yes, my question is about um, notice, not notice of board meetings, but the, um, I, I guess the, the, the minutes of the board meeting. Is there a requirement to send those out on after the board meeting to all members or what? Or can we put them on a um, website or, or what? Again, making sure that they're reasonably available, that there, there's a distinction here between making sure your members are regularly updated about as to what 
the minutes are. I think posting them on the website is sufficient. Mm -hmm. But keep in mind that when you're doing a resale disclosure packet, that you do need to provide the last six months of approved minutes. In right. Okay. Right. Good point. Yes, sir. Is there a question? Okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> Don't be shy. I asked a lot of questions. Um, what types of uh, discussions can happen in executive versus open um, uh, meetings of the board? And you know, that's it. So the question was, what type of discussions can be had in executive session versus general session? The Virginia law actually sets forth a, a very specific list of certain enumerated reasons why you can move into executive session and discuss that. Some examples of those, of those would be to discuss and consider personnel matters, if you have employees or management you want to discuss, uh, to discuss violation of the covenants, delinquencies, to discuss and consider contracts and meeting with legal counsel. Uh, either to discuss pending or probable litigation or just in general to meet with counsel. There may be one or two others in there, but off the top of my head, um, those are the sp a few of the specific ones I can recall. Um, if you have specific questions that you'd like to talk about later, I can point you to the specific statutory provision. Great. Right. We'll have one more question on this topic before we move on, sir. Okay. Whenever the board goes into executive session, do they have <coughs> meeting minutes and are those available to the public? So executive session, I get that question a lot. Is that something we should be recording minutes during? And the answer is no. Uh, when you move into your executive session, the purpose of that is for the board to talk without that being on the record, uh, simply because there are sensitive issues uh, that the Virginia State Legislature understands need to be discussed in a closed session. Uh, the caveat is you can't take any action while you're in the executive session. Whatever action that you propose to take needs to be actually done when you reconvene in your open session after your closed session. Correct. Great question. Great answer, Bruce. Let's move on. We do have about 50 minutes left in this uh, great seminar, but we have other topics to discuss today, and one of them is uh, the fiduciary responsibility that us, the board members have. Uh, with us today is Howard Goldklang, uh, one of the, I think, the charter member of the local CAI chapter. Um, and one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, Howard, was, and I get this often, for, especially from the smaller associations, is what, what is the purpose of an association audit? What does it accomplish, and, and what, are the, what are the best practices to make sure it gets done. Well, a uh, audit's objective is to express an opinion on the association's financial statements, uh, provide independent assurance that financial statements are properly presented, uh, conduct substantive uh, testing of associations, transactions, and documents. That's a basic thumbnail of what what a uh, annual audit would do. So do all associations have to have audits, Howard? Uh, I don't, uh, unless their documents spe specify that they should have an audit. Um, I don't think there's uh, state law that requires it, is there? No, I don't think there's. Uh, good business practices would indicate that you should have an audit, uh, but from uh, the standpoint of any legal requirement, uh, there wouldn't be. Sure, sure. And the audit's obviously ensuring the financial security of the association. And moving on to the second subject on that, Howard, what, what are advisable investments? What, what do community associations, what is the role of the association treasurer in ensuring um, the growth of, of common dues or common funds? Well, that's something you should answer. <laughs> I thought we could tag team this one. Uh, <laughs> My objective has always been uh, safety. Uh, associations collect funds for only one purpose, and that is for future capital expenditures related to their uh, long-term reserve needs. So the only objective really is to have those funds available when the expenditure is needed. And I know we have a reserve specialist here, and the reserve specialist can give you some ideas as to the program necessary to uh, uh, put a, uh, a kind of a framework for uh, reserves and how you would be setting aside those reserves. 
Well, let me reposition my question, Howard. This might be better. Uh, what's the difference between the operating reserves and the replacement reserves? Because I do get that question often, and I always try to refer to, to subject matter experts like yourself. Well, uh, all of you are in associations. All of you work with budgets. All of you work with financial matters. Associations budget uh, to determine what their revenue is going to be. They determine it, uh, determine that in advance of the year. So uh, some expenditures that you're going to make are easy, easily determined. You're, those uh, that are contracts uh, that you have in place tells you how much you should be uh, assessing for that. But there are a lot of expenditures that are unknown to some extent. Um, probably for most associations, a big example would be snow removal. It's hard to determine what the snow removal costs are going to be. The, the objective of the operating reserve is to provide a set, uh, a set of funds available so that if you have a shortfall resulting from some of these unforeseen uh, situations like snow removal, uh, or repairs and maintenance that you didn't anticipate, uh, you have this operating reserve. Uh, industry guidelines uh, rec recommend that you have somewhere between uh, 10 and 20 percent of annual assessments as an operating reserve. So if you have an association with an annual assessment of around 100,000, you should have something like 10,000 to 20,000 in an operating reserve. Right. And that's for contingencies. The replacement reserve, that's um, based on the replacement reserve study. That's an expenditure that's setting aside funds for these future capital uh, needs. It's like any other expenditure. It's not available for anything else other than those replacement reserve expenditures. So that's the difference between the operating reserve, which is a contingency fund for unforeseen circumstances in your operations, the replacement reserve is an expenditure that's setting aside funds for these future capital expenditures. So if you had, as an example, a roof that's going to last uh, 20 years and it's going to cost, uh, say, $100,000, uh, you should be putting aside, uh, I guess, $5,000 a year for that. Um, yeah. And that's an expenditure. That's, $5,000 should not be used for uh, overages and anything else. Uh, it's for that particular purpose. Great. Is there any questions about? Uh, yes, sir. Aren't there tax law uh, requirements for uh, how much you can keep in the reserve? Howard, are you aware? Uh, well, most associations are going to file, probably for the majority of associations here, uh, we file under what's uh, referred to as 1120H, uh, which is uh, uh, revenue uh, uh, assessments are exempt from uh, taxation. So uh, reserves would not be uh, a problem from any kind of way. Sure, Stu, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I was just going to add that uh, oftentimes there will be a third uh, group of funding uh, known as a maintenance or deferred maintenance budget and these are monies that can be set aside to deal with things like painting or caulking and things that the IRS may not technically define as capital in nature um, so we see a lot of our communities will have uh, capital replacement deferred maintenance and then operating but just to go back to the 1128, it wouldn't matter under that method of filing because all the revenue is exempt. Now, if you get into a different method of filing, which we, which is the corporate method of filing, uh, and I don't know if any of your associations would be involved in that, uh, then then okay. these issues have some significance. Right. Yes, ma'am. Um, so you do a reserve study, say, every couple of years. In Virginia, it's required, it's required every five years. In between those years, um, if we take a look at that roof and say, gee, it looks like it's going to last, you know, five more years instead of the, you know, ten that they expected, how much flexibility do does the board have to sort of change the estimates that the reserve study 
determined versus you know our new information in that time period. And are there any best practices or pitfalls that I should look at? Well, that's a question. Yeah, Stuart or Howard. Well, from the reserve is a, and you can discuss this, but the reserves are uh, a projection into the future. It's it's not exact, and consequently, there's going to be more information that comes in to the association. So, if you have uh, information that would be uh, significant, then that's up to the board. It's mm -hmm. your your funds, it's your objectives. Uh, the replacement reserve is a guide. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, we've always recommended, it, we've always recommended that associations have the study done at least every five years. Virginia law now does require it be done every five years. Uh, it could be done uh, every year. I, I don't have a problem with that. I think it's the more information that you have related to these uh, capital expenditures, the better information it uh, it would be. You wouldn't object to doing it every every. <laughs> day. That's a conflict of interest right there. <laughs> it's, it's, it's well worth it. I think CAI recommends every two to three years. That's correct, two to three years of CAI. Jeanette? Yeah. Now, as far, are there any sub-accounts in the reserve? If you're setting aside money in the reserve, then you know. In aggregate, you have to set aside $500,000 over the next year, 30 years or something like that, for 10 different elements. Do you need to have like little subcontracts into that reserve so that in case you something costs more than what you expected? Um, that, I mean, do you know what I'm trying I, th to I think I, yeah, I think I know where you're going. Should we pick the um, question, please? The, the question was, uh, should you have an allowance built into your funding? No, to, should you have sub-accounts? No, I, I think what you're saying is your reserve. Most, most associations are using uh, the cash as pooled for all of the reserve expenditures. Right. Uh, and then you, know, you right. could probably talk about... Yeah, I don't think too many management companies would split it out. If you're self-managed, you might have the option to do that. But again, that's an internal accounting issue. That you, you know, do you yeah. want to take that on? Yeah, there's two different uh, there's two different elements here. One is the objective of the replacement reserves, and the other element is funding. Mm -hmm. And the funding uh, aspect of it, and you can talk about the cash flow methods versus the, uh, uh, full, the funding. full funding or threshold. Or uh, there's a variety of different. Uh, ways of looking at the reserves from a funding standpoint, mm -hmm. but the program itself is to, is laid out as to this is what's going to be. Uh, these are the components for the replacement reserve. These are the costs to replace. These are the remaining useful lives. And wh whatever your funding method is, that's not going to change. Right. Right, and this is a great segue into Stu, obviously our reserve study specialist here. Stu, we're talking about reserving, how to adequately uh, do this. Uh, there are different ways to do it, and I'd be surprised when I talk to my board members, sometimes they're not aware. Could you, could you tell us a little bit more about what the difference between the full funding and the cash flow method are, and how would it apply to uh, stakeholders here? Sure, absolutely. And, and just to add uh, to that last question again, the, the line items in the reserve schedule are really just in there to let us develop the annual funding requirement. Once that annualized funding requirement has been calculated and you're, and it's in your budget and you have that balance in your fund going forward, you can use that balance for any capital issue that comes up. It's not <coughs> nailed to those specific <coughs> items. Um, which, which kind of touches on the, the, there's generally two main schools of thought uh, as far as the uh, financial funding strategies go, how you save your money every year and what that number should be. Uh, the first method is known as uh, full funding or component method or straight line method. And that's just simply uh, 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 a factor of total depreciation at any given time. For example, say you had a lot of fencing and it was worth $100,000 and you, had, you knew that you had to typically replace it every 10 years. 
Well, then your annual funding requirement would be just 10,000 a year times 10, you got your 100,000. Uh, if you were going to determine your percent funded, which is, seems to be a hot topic these days, uh, if your community was five years old, to be 100% funded, you would need to have a balance of 50,000. It's just straight line, straight math. Now, the thing that happens if you use that method is that because the typical reserve schedule has multiple line items in it, and all these different items have different life cycle economics, you know, you're also reserving in many cases for your asphalt roadway, which might go 15 or 18 or 20 years. You've got this fence that's every 10 years. You know, you've got street lights that are, you know, 25 years. And what happens over time is that these overlapping straight line component fundings start to pile up on top of each other. And you actually, in almost every case, you end up with a lot of extra money. You know, 10, 20, certainly 30 years down the road. It's hard to explain this without my graphs, but <laughs> as you go farther, farther down the road, you end up with, typically you'll end up with quite a bit of a surplus when you follow that full funding method. So what most, most of our clients end up doing is, what's, is the other way to do it, which is collectively known as a cash flow based method. Some people call it the pooling method, because as we were just saying, rather than trying to uh, you know, uh, fund every single line item 100% at any given moment for its depreciation, instead, you just say you, you you plot out your expenditure schedule. You know, you have the reserve study done, so now you know that you're going to need a hundred thousand in ten years, you're going to need two hundred and fifty thousand in eighteen years for that road, you're gonna need forty thousand for the street lights in twenty-five years. So we plot we plot out all of these expenditure requirements over time. And instead of just doing straight line calculations, we say, okay, let's set, in the case of a threshold uh, strategy, let's set a minimum closing balance that we're comfortable with over the next 20 to 30 years. And let's just put away enough money every year so that we don't fall below that level. Let's leave ourselves a bit of a cushion. We always recommend using at least 5% of the total value of all your common assets uh, as that cushion. So instead, we, we do that calculation. Um, and that, so, so in essence, you are fully funding for every project that comes due over the course of time, but that cash flow based calculation is almost always quite a bit less per year than the full funding calculation would be. And uh, many times uh, an older community or a community that has fallen behind in their reserves, um, you know, they're lucky to, they're lucky if they can do that 5% threshold uh, cash flow method. Um, it also kind of begs the question, you know, what is percent funded? There's, there's been a lot of talk in the reserve industry lately about you know, is there going to be some sort of a, a housing rating system for condominiums and HOAs? Is, you know, are we gonna come up with this like magic uh, metric that's gonna say, well, you know, are they good, are they doing, are they doing well with reserves or are they doing poorly or should it be based on percent funded? And I think we have to be very careful uh, with how that goes because again, Typically when people talk about percent funded, they're talking about percent of that fully funding method, which is very conservative. And it's really, it's really speaking to total accumulated depreciation, which is not necessarily needed. Again, um, you can be fully funded. You can be 100% funded as long as you're meeting your cash flow projections, your expenditure projections. Yes, sir. Question in the back. Yeah, obviously on the sound microphone, but the, <laughs> the uh, ebbs and flows, you know, we're talking about you can have several, like, let's say, capital uh, assets that might 
need like parking lot and the fence might need to be done one year. Do you, uh, maybe for any of you, do you ever see like successful use of debt instruments or would that be a bad idea to get into? If the banker's no. smiling, probably needs to know. <laughs> oh. Well, I, uh, we talked about that a little bit last time and I almost got booed out of here. No, no, no. Okay. Yes, I'm kidding. But I, I will answer your question. Um, I, I'm going to go next. But uh, was there any more questions about... Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. For the reserve study, does that have to be part of like the closing documents if you sell the house? Like, Is it different if it's a condo versus if it's just like a homeowners association? The actual reserve study, is, is that one of the components that you have to actually get to the buyers? I know, I know Bruce probably, believe, probably has something to say about this, but as far as I know, yes. Um, and, that's an, and, and that speaks to the importance of having healthy reserves right now. Uh, one thing that we touched on last time was most people, when they think of capital reserves, they're thinking, yeah, we, you know, 20 years from now, we're going to need some money. But as, as, you're, as you're indicating, uh, it becomes important today, tomorrow, to be able to demonstrate in a dis disclosure, a real estate disclosure, that yes, right now our reserve levels are proper, they're healthy, and that, that adds value right now to the community. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, yes, one question. With the reserve analysis, could write a whole analysis, or can you just provide the executive summary? That's a good question. Let's look at the statute. Got it. Yeah. Yes, sir. In the back, all the way in the back. So, if the percentage or the cash flow, is it that the decree, if you're using a depreciation scale, that it tends to be considerably more conservative than the actual need? So you depreciate and figure, well, these retaining walls might last 30 years, but then you get to a certain point, you bank the amount of money that's needed for the reserve for a complete replacement, but they li but they last another 10 years, and so you just keep accumulating funds. Is that why the percentage? And then maybe, but does that also presume that maybe you might need a special assessment in there if you're below? Well, one of the main strategies, one of the main goals to having an accurate capital replacement reserve analysis done is to avoid the dreaded special assessment, or, or even financing for that matter. Um, what was the first part of your question again? You end up, your associations tend oh, yeah, to yeah. more money. If you keep saving, yeah. What if your retaining wall goes an extra 10 years? Well, I think that, I think that gets back to uh, you know the need to to treat your reserve study as a living document, and and it really does it really is affected by so many variables. It's a, it's affected by weather events. It's affected by uh, construction prices that that are volatile. It's affected by how much money the the community actually does reserve. They don't always do what we recommend. So it gets back to the need to revisit this document every two or three years we recommend. Um, and, and every three years you should include a, an update that includes a site visit so that you're looking at things mm. like that retaining wall. Uh, you know, have an engineer go out there, a reserve specialist go out there and say, you know what, you could probably squeeze another five years out of this retaining wall. Let's adjust your funding level. See, see what the net effect is, but you're always kind of trying to tweak that annual funding to, because it's really not an exact science. You're just trying to keep it on the tracks going down the road so that you're somewhere close when you need to be. Yes, ma'am. Um, my experience being on the board for 13, 14 years is that every time we do a reserve study or a reserve study update, the future cost of things that were, re, you know, that a price and a timeline was set for three years ago, when you do an update now, and now says those things are going to cost 20% more, more, right? Well, it's projected <laughs> yeah, three yeah. years ago. So even though you're saving everything, every time you do a reserve update, it results in needing to put more into reserves than your last <laughs> reserve study did, even though the life the life of nothing, there's nothing significant that we said, oh, we thought it was going to last 20 years, but no, it's only going to last 15. Even if everything still lasts the same amount of time, basically because 
you're closer to the point where it will be replaced, you have a better estimate of what the replacement cost will be. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. another, that wasn't really a question, I guess, but <laughs> how, do, how do boards deal with that, I guess? And then the other thing is, you know, the reserve study states an anticipated amount of um, income on the reserves. And again, in 10 or 13 years, we, and certainly in the last eight years, we've never been able to achieve that amount of growth. I mean, when you look at CDs have 1% sure. rates, you know, we're not gonna get 3% growth on their reserve balances. So we're kind of falling behind in that respect too, that we have to contribute more than the reserve study says, just to stay even with the reserve study. I guess any reaction from anybody on that, on yeah. how as a board we sure. should deal with that. Yeah, again, I, again, I think we're you know we're getting back to that. It's really important to to revisit that document. Um, even even if it even if you just do what's known as a paper update that that doesn't include a site visit again say you do a paper update every two years and that's where we pull up the file we see what your current fund balance is any interest earned um, adjust for pricing and aging uh, that's the best way to hedge against those fluctuations. That Those kinds of things happen when you wait six years or eight years to do an update. If you stay on that thing, if you at least do a paper update at, in, you know, in two years, maybe at four years you do a, a level two, including a site visit, um, that's the best way to, to keep that on track. And the paper updates, I mean, we're talking about six six to eight hundred dollars to, to oh, do a paper okay, update. Yeah. So it's relatively, you know, a, a minor expense. Because our reserve study, our five-year reserve study is, I don't know, five thousand dollars or so. We can't pay five thousand dollars every year. We'd have to reserve for the reserve study. Yeah, no, that would be like, <laughs> <laughs> Well, that goes back to, I guess, you know, seeking professional help, understanding who, what the company that you're working with, that they're ethical, that they know what, the, what, you know, they have experience in dealing with community associations locally, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Question, yes. If you have a very large unexpected operating expense in one year and you don't have the money in your operating budget to handle that, you've talked tonight about a special assessment, you've talked about possibility of a loan, you've talked about an operating reserve fund. Could you talk though about taking taking care of that unexpected expense through the uh, capital reserve fund? Yeah, I would kind of, uh, as, as far as reserves go, I, I know that it's kind of a last resort that you don't want to have to pull from capital reserves. I, I would leave it up to Bruce to comment on I would any, actually leave uh, that one up to Howard. Hot <laughs> 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 <Trying to>. potato. <laughs> that's a tough one. Well, that's why the, uh, the objectives of, of financial management is that you you have an operating reserve that you build replacement reserves. Uh, I don't. I don't. I like. Uh, I like associations to look at their replacement reserves in the most conservative manner because of situations like that. Um, the uh, if you if you are budgeting uh, properly and you're building up adequate operating reserves and adequate replacement reserves, uh, then uh, you shouldn't have a problem. If you do, sometimes uh, uh, we had an association with major flooding. Uh, obviously, snow removal can be a, a significant unexpected circumstance. Um, the uh, reserve funds, uh, the only the only potential problem, and uh, I didn't get into this because it's uh, uh, it's um, it's very complex when you get into the other method of tax filing. The exempt method is is simpler, uh, but if you get into the corporate method of filing, and there, uh, when you were talking about capital reserves and how they're treated and how they can be expended. Uh, you could run into a potential tax problem. 
But uh, I would recommend that associations, if they are forced into that situation that you recommend, that you have a temporary borrowing from the replacement reserve with a formal uh, pro plan and program of how you're going to pay that back. And even if you have to have a special assessment uh, in the next year to pay it back, then you should have that as part of your plan. Because the reserves are expended funds. It's a percentage this year for something that's going to occur in five or 10 or 15 years. But it's you've used up that portion. So it's an expense to you. So that portion of the roof or that portion of the uh, sidewalk or any other element has been utilized for you living there at that point in time. So it is an expended fund. And, uh, but the funds are available. It's not, uh, it's not like a true nonprofit where you have uh, true restricted funds that can't be used. They're board designated restricted funds. But they're in a framework of, of uh, good financial management. And so you've got to take all of those things into consideration. But, uh, and I'm, I'm president of an association and it's a constant battle with the rest of the board to try and get adequate funding through the budget because there's a, there's a paradox with associations. Uh, nobody wants to pay uh, the assessments, but everybody wants their association <laughs> to be as valuable as possible. And you can't do that without revenue. You've got to have the revenue to make the expenditures. You've got to have the revenue to make these capital expenditures. And uh, you read periodically, like in uh, a week or so ago, or a few weeks ago, about in, this, in the Post, there was an article about um, a building uh, that's got cracks in it, uh, or another building that can't uh, replace the elevator, it's eight floors, so the people have to walk up eight floors because they can't replace the elevators. So you can run into those types of problems uh, if you don't have adequate reserves, adequate operations, and a reasonable budget uh, developed properly by the uh, community, the board. That's a great answer, Howard. Yes, ma'am. Um, so far, people have been talking about reserves mainly from the standpoint of you have reserves to ensure that you have the money when the expense hits. But what about the role in re of reserves in spreading the cost over the people who live in the community, over the life of the community, so the people who are living there when the big expense hits don't pay the cost of the people who were living there 10 years ago and 10 years in the future? Well, that's what I was now, just saying, that you, as those who are living there, are utilizing the uh, roof, utilizing the um, common elements, all of the common elements. So it's a true expense to you, and so those funds, those funds are being set aside for the actual expenditure of that of that roof. But um, there's a lot of other topics. I guess you wanted to talk sure, about. Sure, sure. Uh, it doesn't always it doesn't always go that way. But that's yeah. That's what we call the concept of fair stewardship. You're you're paying to you're paying for that roof that has kept you dry for ten years. You know you pay as you go, rather than wait till the end. That's fair stewardship, and that's another goal of having the reserve the annualized funding determined in a in a fair way, equitable way. Yes. Is there any liability for the office if they don't get it achieved during that period of time to actually be liable back to the people who are there? Like basically, if you're not setting aside the money, mm -hmm. if you can't get the people to do it, then all sure. of a sudden you start realizing you're 50,000 behind, mm -hmm. so then the people in 10 years from now need to replace it. Can you ever be held accountable, if, assuming you're still in the area? <laughs> <laughs> you haven't slept Bruce? this Bruce? <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. Uh, the answer there is if, if it sometimes can be hard to certainly balance the political problem of having to raise assessments versus fully funding your, your reserve study in accordance with the study that you have. Uh, what I would say to that is if you're unable to meet your funding requirements that are set forth in the study, you should have a, an express and a good reason why. 
It shouldn't just be, well, we don't want to raise assessments. There should be an absolute reason why. Well, we've tried to raise assessments and we can't get the membership to approve it. Or we had these uh, unnecessary or, or these necessary expenditures that prevented us from reserving this year. There should be a good reason as opposed to we just don't feel like doing it. Uh, and your membership should be made aware that the board is for this specific purpose not funding fully this year. Uh, but if, if with regard to personal liability, I think you have to, again, find yourself in that bad faith, willful misconduct area before you get into trouble. Thanks, Bruce. Now, we are trying to end this at 8 o'clock promptly to respect everybody's time, so we have one more subject to get to, but we will take one more question, ma'am. Thank you. I was actually going to change from the <coughs> reserve. Sure. One, one comment and one question. We went last night to the Fairfax County-sponsored Virginia uh, Legislative Forum that takes place every year with experts from across the region talking about the legislative action that is coming down the pike for community associations. And we go every year, and I, it's highly recommended. We learn so much. But we also, I have a question that didn't get answered sure. last night. And they, they talked about needing to get, if we have, we have rules and regulations in our community, but they're just rules and regulations that the board needs up. Um, and we distributed them, you know, we had community input. But they were saying last night that we have to get the members to acknowledge them. Um, but then it was a question of, you know, do these things have to be adopted by the membership or... Um, you know, again, we want to have guidelines, but sure. you know, we know we can't enforce any of them. But, uh, I'll say two things. Number one, that's a CAI event, so thanks for going to that. <laughs> uh, for CAI, wonderful. There you go, Appreciate fantastic. Um, and why don't you and I discuss after this one, so Raf can, can get to his point here. And I'll sure, yeah. sure, and, I, and I'll, I'll be quick. This this point, you know, last time I was here, I talked about uh, lending to community associations. Right? Somebody was asking, how can we leverage debt tools right now? Well, the good thing is that. For borrowers, the rates are very attractive. You're looking at prime rate at three and a half percent, right? That's that's kind of the ballpark for your A plus borrowers, your A plus borrowers, and you price from there. The bad thing is for savers, you can't get much of anything, right? One percent if you're lucky, uh, because the net interest margin between what we what we pay and what we put out is is very small, very very thin. But I do want to talk about uh, the fiduciary responsibility of the board of directors. Uh, when I started my career around 2004, 2005, I just got in the military, started working at the bank, and there were a lot of internet banks that were popping up. Can anybody remember NetBank? Does that ring a bell? Or Washington Mutual around 2005, 2006? So I was just starting on my cash management. I was, under, I was, I was taking in a lot of deposit from community associations because the rates were good, so people were locking in four or five years. And I started seeing money go out. But as the maturities came out, people started rolling it out. This, these are property managers and boards as well to Washington Mutual, NetBank, some of these other banks were paying way above market rates. We're talking at that time six and a half, seven and a half percent rates for CDs at that time. And that was just, uh, you know, rates were good, but not that good. So <laughs> we, were, we were kind of scratching our head. And what we realized later was that these banks were hemorrhaging money on the front end. So we were, they, were, they needed money bad. So they were willing to pay above market rates to get the money to come in. So the one note I want to leave you here is just be, be mindful of, of chasing the rate. Everybody here has that fiduciary responsibility to for good stewardship of the funds. Uh, competitive rates, of course. Uh, some banks, some of the larger banks, they're very, uh, they have a lot of overhead. They're not going to pay you much, five, 10 basis points if you're lucky. But check out some of the banks who have a specialty in working with community association banks. If you ask, they might have some rate sheets for you that are not public. They're more for their nonprofits and community associations where you could take advantage of some better rates, above market rates, not crazy rates, but still be working with a bank that understands how to do business with community associations. Uh, on the lending side, you know, in theory, uh, community associations should never have to borrow. Right, because you're adequately reserving, you're budgeting correctly. We just talked about that here, uh, but things happen. Um, things happen. Whether it's a hum oh, it's a big snowstorm that knocks out a common element. We had the derecho a few years ago. That, you know, a lot of communities were severely impacted, 
and they just didn't have the reserves to take care of one of these common elements that was severely impacted. So for those who are, find themselves in that position, but have a reserve study, have good counsel, you always have to have a counsel to borrow. Uh, we talked about that last time. Uh, there are opportunities to leverage debt instruments. Uh, debt instruments are, are good to take care of that issue right away. Uh, the loan terms are no longer than five years, so you have up to five years to pay that back. Uh, and again, the terms are great, anywhere from uh, three and a half to six and a half percent uh, for borrowing rates. So if you do need to go down that road, again, not all banks are created equal, not all banks understand how to work with community associations, ask for a referral, go to the CAI website for banks that understand how to do business with community associations. And lastly, real quick, uh, I was asked last time some investment, you know, what can we do to get some, some interest, some returns on our, our funds? You know, it is tough. We're in a depressed interest rate environment right now. Uh, I don't think anything's going to happen until the end of the year, to be quite honest. The Federal Reserve has raised the prime rate one time since 2009, and that still hasn't made, moved the needle much on deposit rates. Uh, but there are some tools that you can use, such as ladders. Um, operating reserves should mostly always stay in money market accounts, so you have liquidity for them. Uh, those uh, replacement reserves, you can put them in CDs. Um, if you've heard of tools like laddering CD, CD ladders, those are fantastic strategies for you to take advantage of a higher rate, uh, and then CDs are always rolling off every 18 to uh, 12 months. Those are fantastic ways for you to leverage your assets to get to get a higher weighted return on your, on your reserve uh, funds. And if you have any questions about that, or how those strategies, feel free to feel free to reach out to me directly. Actually, I believe Howard Volklang, he wrote a book on uh, the role of the association treasurer. He brought a couple, couple copies that are in the back. Grab that on your way out. It actually talks about the uh, laddering strategy and the dumbbell strategy. So those of you who are sitting on a pile of cash but are unhappy with your rate of return, uh, take a look at the laddering strategy and how you can uh, access a higher rate uh, while still maintaining some liquidity on the short end. So, thank, yeah, it's a great book uh, written by Howard. So we have about five minutes left here. I did want to have every panelist give a closing uh, comment. And then we'll, if everybody stays in the room for an initial two minutes, we just want to get some information about future, future seminars. Um, so Lori, you've been quiet for a little bit. What, what should community associations clusters look for in their uh, insurance provider? You, you really want somebody who's educated, who knows what your community association needs. So you want somebody with experience in the community association industry and ask those questions. When, when you call looking for an agent, ask them what their experience is. How many years have they been doing this? Um, do they understand how the association is to be set up or governed uh, via their governing documents? Um, ask them what their education has been. Um, unfortunately, to get an insurance license, I hate, I hate to say it, but it's very, very easy. If you're good at memorizing, you can take the book, do the practice tests, go to the testing center. If you come out with a 60 or better, you got your insurance license. 60 or better, huh? <laughs> or, or that's what it was 10 right, years right. ago. Sure, sure, sure. I got mine. Um, so you really want to look for somebody who is continuing their education beyond that. They're, they're getting designations. They're, they're getting involved in groups like CAI, and they're learning, um, working beyond their current knowledge base. They're, they're reaching to learn more so that they can do more for you. Fantastic. Thanks, Lori. Stu? Similar, same question. Yeah. Um, so again, uh, you know, maintaining, establishing accurate and adequate capital reserves for the community is the single most important effort a, a community can make in uh, preserving property values. Um, make sure that your uh, reserve provider is uh, certified by CAI as a reserve specialist, RS. Uh, if possible, try to pick a reserve provider that also uh, manages the construction projects that, that are being reserved for. That, that gives those firms a unique uh, opportunity to stay in touch with current pricing. It ends up being more accurate. You know, if we, if we manage paving projects every summer, we, we know what that costs uh, as of right now. Um, 
And what else? Yeah, I guess that's, that's a good answer. Absolutely. Howard? Well, I just would say that uh, it's been a very enjoyable. Uh, and uh, by, I know everybody looks at an account and thinks, well, they're just a uh, depressing <laughs> group of people because all they talk about is keep <laughs> budgeting and raising funds and assessing and over assessing. But in reality, uh, it's, it's the one thing that I, I'm happy that I was able to at least come here and say how important it is to uh, make sure that you budget adequately, you don't do things like fee targeting and saying we're not going to have an increase this year or we're only going to have 1% when we need 3% or 2% when we need 5%. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Howard. Bruce? I think you, you, you've heard sort of a common theme for, for any professional that your association is, is looking to engage services of. Um, make sure they understand what you are. Community associations are rather unique. You're not a business, but you're not a collection of homeowners either. You're somewhere in between. Uh, we like to say that you are a business because you deal with money and funds, but you're not the same as a, a brick and mortar uh, retail shop. There's something different that makes a community association unique. Look for a professional that has experience in working with those. A great resource we've heard from, from many people is CAI. Go to their website. There's a service directory there of, of uh, many professionals who, who routinely work with community associations. So again, thank you for having us. Absolutely, thank you, Bruce. And I'll just continue the theme. CI is a fantastic resource there. Again, if, another way to do it is ask your fellow cluster board members. Ask them for a referral. Who do they work with? Are they happy? That, that's a great way, just communication amongst everybody. Uh, I didn't finish my WAMU and uh, NetBank story. What happened was that those banks went under, and then they were, in, they were uh, FDIC receivership. So what happened to those high CD rates, as soon as uh, ING and Chase bought them or took them over, they slashed them to the bare bottom of the rates. So all that effort for essentially nothing. But uh, just be mindful of that. If, the rate, if it seems too good to be true, it might be. So keep that in mind. And on the banking side, of course, um, not all banks are created equal. Some banks don't want to do, they don't even understand what a community association is. So make sure that whoever you're dealing with understands what a community association is and your unique nature. So again, thank you all for having us here. We have five, about two minutes left here. I did want to ask a question on behalf of, all right, we we're trying to do more of these seminars. If I could just get a couple hands or some uh, or some feedback from the audience here. What, what additional seminars would be beneficial to you if anybody has an idea? Yes, ma'am. So this comes from the discussion last night sure. about um, the movement back to your original documents and really understanding what those are and how you use them. And I think going into last night, I thought we were in pretty good shape, but now I, I'm, I'm really not sure. I think that's something um, that... Sure, governance documents. And how, yes. how to modify your governance. Sure, I mean, governance documents, we, we joke around. We could have Bruce and the whole line of the room full of attorneys and not be done in a half-day seminar. But yeah, that's great. We will take, we'll take that note into consideration, hopefully uh, do another seminar like that. Any other comments, questions, or suggestions on additional topics or seminars? Yes, sir. Updating design uh, standards and okay. how that relates, especially to new materials. Okay, updating design standards. Uh, <laughs> Sharing the values, the common values. Okay. Uh, so I guess anything else? Yes, ma'am. I think you could easily do a whole seminar devoted to insurance and a whole seminar devoted to reserves. Yes, you're right. You're right. And we probably will. We're just trying to think of something that you, you don't see here. That's a great one over there. Architecture design. Yes. I think legal guidelines 101 for running a good board. Sure. What are the requirements under the law? Just the basics. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ma'am, same thing. Yeah. Sir? You know, along those lines, what's happened legally in the last few years and it's likely to happen in the next couple with the state legislature? Sure. So they do review. Right, right, correct, correct. And, and again, just to not, not to belabor the point, but CI, we do have a, a annual conference and expo where we have a slew of, of, of panelists and, and, and seminars regarding all these topics. So I encourage you, I did leave some information in those packets. Take a look at it, get involved. I think you could find some fantastic information there. So we hope that you found this very informative and helpful. We thank you for your time and uh, have a great evening. Thank you guys.